Hello everybody, I'm Steven Yehelko with California State Parks out of the Sonoma Mendocino Coast District. And today uh, we are coming to you live from Hendy Woods State Park. Um, now, uh, I actually have a guest with me today. Um, and she is one of the very fabulous uh, members of the Hendy Woods community. And um, so we are going to introduce her in a little bit. I do want to make sure that everybody uh, knows that we are being uh, responsible and uh, keeping our safe distance. So while I'll be on this side of the camera, um, our guest speaker will be on the other side of the camera. Now, um, today we're going to be talking about wildflowers. And uh, a lot of people do um, celebrate Earth Day on Saturday. I thought it was kind of strange, um, but actually kind of fabulous that in this time we were able to celebrate Earth Day on the 22nd when it was supposed to happen. Um, but I made arrangements with one of our uh, great volunteers um, to actually talk about wildflowers because she is an expert. Well, sulfur game, you know, we, we uh, can all be experts in our own mind. But, uh, you know, um, just as not, my knowledge set only goes so far, uh, she has specified a good amount of time uh, into loving and appreciating wildflowers. And I think you'll find uh, that is great. So, anyways, we are getting ready and... Um, Thank you for joining. Now, um, I'm going to turn the camera around and introduce to you, drum roll, Angela DeWitt. All right, Angela. Thanks for having me here today. It's kind of a serious privilege to be in the park right now, so I'm really excited to be here and checking out these plants that I've been kind of spending a lot of time at home wondering what's going on with the vanilla leaf, what's going on with the, uh, the fairy bells, what do the trilliums in the park look like right now? So today we're here and we're checking it out. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the under canopy in the redwoods. These plant communities are really specific. Like we'll notice that certain types of plants really enjoy growing together. Um, so we've got our redwoods here, and the plants that are growing in here are really different from the ones, say, that are out in the meadow, a couple hundred yards that away. Um, they like shade, they like it to be moist, um, they like it to be pretty cool, um, and they've got, they tend to have very soft leaves that um, are really permeable to water. So, like for example, um, plants that you see out in the meadow are going to have kind of harder leaves that have kind of a bit of a seal over it with the cells so that the water doesn't transpire right out of them when they have all this direct sun. But here in the redwoods, things can be a little bit more delicate because they're protected by these big trees in the upper canopy and in the upper stories. So right now we're here looking at a few things that are blooming. We've got a um, gonna get uh, get down to it yeah yeah okay all right so the vanilla leaf has three big beautiful leaves that are a little bit kind of serrated along the edge um this is one of the flowers from the vanilla leaf um it's in the barberry family which um if you're familiar with like the inside out plant it's also called redwood ivy it's in the same family as that and it's got all of these tiny flowers along this little spike right here. I got another one right here. Yeah. Check that out. So right now, not so much, but a little bit later in the season, you know, if and when the park reopens, um, as you walk through here after these die out and they get a little bit dry, you'll maybe come around a bend in the trail and just be overwhelmed by it. It smells like sugar cookies or mm -hmm. kind of vanilla. And that's the smell of these leaves once they start to dry out a little bit. It's pretty fantastic. Um, yeah, I always think it smells like animal crackers when I uh, come around one of those corners. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's. I think you're. You, you nailed it right Spot there. Spot on. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite scents when we're coming around a corner. Of course, um, during the. Uh, during our program today, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, put them in the comments and I will uh, share them with, uh, with Angela here. Or if you have any particular information about the things that we're looking at that you would like to share, 
I'm always interested in learning more, so please feel free to lay it on me here. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, we're all learning here. <laughs> um, right here we've got some a beautiful little patch of redwood sorrel. Um, a lot of folks will call it clover, and you can definitely see why because of the shape of the leaves. Um, but the way that we classify plants as far as what family they're in is always by the way that the parts of the flower are organized. So a clover family is in, or clovers are in the pea family, so they have a very specific flower shape. And this redwood sorrel also has a very specific uh, flower shape, and that's how we can tell it's in a different plant family, even though the leaves look the same. This has got these um, five leaves, and it's got the the ovary of the plant is under the leaves, and then it's got bilateral symmetry. So if you like mm -hmm. draw a line down the middle, it's the same on both sides. Um, now, I'm seeing um, actually down here, and I kind of noticed that uh, some of these of the redwood sorrel, um, five petals, but I'm seeing a lot of gnats oh, yeah. on there. And I'll, um, what you might know, or you know, maybe you can help me out with this, but the, the gnats are the pollinators of these, aren't they? Well, among others, right? Well, they're on there, and I'm assuming they're picking up pollen and moving it from one to another just because they're on there, so yeah. Um, yeah. That, Constantly that learning. Like... I think it is gnats, <laughs> but uh, you know what? <laughs> That that's looks the, like a relationship that's happening right there. <laughs> yeah, I often see the gnats on there, uh -huh. and yes, but the redwood sorrel is undeniably just uh, one of the most common understory plants in our redwood forest, given that they're called redwood sorrel. Now, um, have you ever eaten redwood sorrel before? Yes, I have. It's, um, it's a little bit sour, kind of tart. And it's in the same family as like spinach, the oxalis family. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get that um, kind of uh, astringent, tart feeling in your mouth. And it's kind of yeah. just like other sorrels. I would say it kind of tastes like a uh, sour apple. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. So they say, and uh, I've never tested it out. I mean, you know, I've only had it at a, as a small trail snack. But they say maybe if you eat too much of it, it's high in oxalic acid, given that it's oxalis. Yeah, you don't want to come in here and collect a whole bunch and make a smoothie out of it. That would be bad news. And yeah. <laughs> in fact, we don't really want to pick any of the plants in the park anyway. Absolutely. Even if they have edible or medicinal qualities. Yeah. Um, human usefulness isn't the only property a plant has. It exists in and of itself, and it deserves to just be left and, and to live. Okay. Yes, that's true. Um, of course, I, I should have been the person mentioning that, but <laughs> yes, uh, in our park, and we have such a beautiful park, uh, if there are edible plants, uh, we do not want you to pick them. In fact, all the plants uh, in the park are protected by law. So don't forage for plants in uh, Handy Woods. Please. Please. <laughs> and also, we want to keep these plants around for everybody to enjoy. This is what parks are all about, is the natural, like being able to experience this uh, nature in like some of the most like lush, uh, untouched portions of Hendy Woods is right here. And we're, we're pretty far out on the trail system, aren't we? Yeah, we are. We've kind of had to hoof it a little bit yeah. to get here. We've hiked about a mile. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm surprised we still have service. <laughs> All right. What else are we seeing here? Well, you know, behind you a little bit, we've got a gorgeous couple of irises. Want to go Ooh, take a look at those? Let's go. All right. I'm going to take the lead here and uh, we'll come back to that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. iris and I had to stop and think about it for a second because I tend to think of um, the irises in the Anderson Valley area as being the Boltu virus or the macro siphon um, but that maybe is just because where I live that's the more common one um, this iris has a fairly short little tube right here that goes from the base 
to where the ovary of the plant is. And so I think you might be right about it being a Douglas. But, you know, every year I say that I'm going to learn to tell my irises apart and learn to tell oaks apart and then get really into ferns. And like, like I have this list of plants that I say every year I'm going to learn all the differences. Yeah, just like just like uh, every year, I say that I'm going to finally learn all the bird sounds, all of the bird sounds. All every bird sound. I only yeah. successfully take up about one per year, so. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a goal. <laughs> yeah, we're constantly learning. Even uh, you know, park interpreters and the guides that are leading these. Uh, you know, I, I did say expert earlier, and I don't think that anybody can really be an expert at any topic, you know? Well, it's true. I'm, I'm here because I want to learn and not because I know yeah, everything. Absolutely. Oh, boy. I yeah. <laughs> way too much to know here. But Douglas Iris. Now, let's check this out. The cool thing about Douglas Iris is you can see just such complex colors in here. We got purples, whites, and yellow, and the yellow actually acts as a nectar guide it informs um the pollinators of where the nectar is and so they can actually crawl right in there um it's like a get, little landing strip yeah it's like <laughs> here's all the goods the uh the nectar is right here and it's just such a showy flower i think um of one of you know it is definitely one of my favorites um in the forest but of course we all have our own opinion on what is the coolest flower in uh <laughs> i think they're all the coolest yeah and it's got the little you know the petal kind of on the top here that's gonna as the pollinators come in and out that's going to kind of vibrate and ensure that the pollen moves around and moves off of the wings of bugs that are going in mm -hmm. um, so all of these flowers have different adaptations or different strategies that they've developed to make sure that the pollen goes um, where it's supposed to or comes off of whoever's visiting it from another flower yeah you know i saw one of our very famous flowers um, just around the corner here um, in fact it's probably the best specimen I've seen all day oh. and I don't even know that we saw it until you were already talking so <laughs> okay. so continue this way because I saw a really cool wake robin trillium and it was hiding behind this fern the whole time Now, uh, Trillium, and I called it Wake Robin, um, is actually get that, that name comes from the fact that this flower actually blooms uh, right at the beginning of, well, you know, middle of spring, but it's just, it coincides with about the time that the robins start showing up in our area. It's just such a poetic name. It's really, really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Trillium, of course, gets, you know, you three. Threes, of course. Threes. All parts of the plant are in threes. Um, yeah. And one of the neat things about a Trillium is um, it takes an incredibly long time for a single plant to get to be about this size. And in the springtime, it'll grow up, it'll put out its leaves, it'll put out its flower. Um, and then it all dies back and it hides under the ground until the next spring. So during the brief time that it's got its leaves out and it's flowering, it's got to gather enough energy from the sun and, you know, photosynthesize enough to store all of its energy in its root for the next spring when it's time to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. It only gets one shot. So I think that's a really good reminder as to, you know, and, um, while flowers are beautiful and everything you know it, it's important to know that you know just the act of uh, actually picking a flower can actually be harmful to it and while this plant has taken about you know almost seven years to develop its first flower um it will continue to flower um almost every year after that uh seven years and has stored enough energy in its bulb to actually you know make flowers but it just acts as a reminder to stay you know stay on the trail and to um not pick the flowers again we are in a state park and um, these flowers 
Uh, we want to keep them around for everybody to enjoy. Plus, it's just beautiful. Look at it. Ah, that would give you a closer view, but I'd have to get off trail to do that. <laughs> All right, what else are we seeing? You know, right here behind the trillium, there's a really beautiful fairy bell. Ooh, yeah. Can't quite get to it, but we did see a couple of more on the trail back there that are nice and low. Ooh, yeah, so we were looking there? there, but it's hard to get there because look at all this greenery it would have to tromp in order to get there. Not, <laughs> not worth it. Not worth it. Like, we can be on the hunt for another one. Um, oh, here we go. Was it this one? Yeah. Oh, right. All yes. Right. See, the cool thing, and one of my favorite things about Angela is she just <laughs> bellies down in order to uh, get to see these flowers. This is and what you got to do. Yeah. So it's got this beautiful kind of structure on the stem with the leaves kind of zigzagging off of the stalk. And you can't really see it from the top when you're walking along the trail. But if you learn to recognize what's here leaf-wise, then this time of year, you can check and see if they're blooming. Kind of get down. You don't have to lay down on the trail, but you can if you want to, as long as you're on the trail. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Me and Angela are, the, are some of the people <laughs> who get down on our bellies in order to look at flowers. And I do it for mushrooms and all sorts of things. So it's just these <laughs> tiny little beautiful things hiding under here it's a little lily so it's got you know three petals or uh six tepals which is a sepal that looks like a petal or a petal that looks like a sepal and um it's just hanging out there they're just incredibly beautiful it's kind of like hunting for Easter eggs when you look for these little guys. You know what's cool about um, getting on your belly and doing things like that? And I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted right now because I found this... Where are you? I'm trying to get it in the camera. This little baby slug. Or sorry, snail. Oh. And that's a baby Pacific side-banded snail. Oops. Nice. Yeah, it's oh. so tiny. That is so tiny. Yeah, sometimes, you know, getting closer to the ground, you might find a lot more. Um, but yeah, anyways, uh, we were looking at the fairy bells. This is a closer <laughs> view of one. You know, people come to the redwoods to experience these big trees and they do a lot of looking up. And when I come to the redwoods, I actually, I have to remember to look up. Like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, there's, really there's trees. trees up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep. Gotta get up again. <laughs> nice snail. Okay. Let's see, we have one more that I for sure wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah. All right. Lead the way. So while we're walking there, I'll just mention one of my favorite tools is a loop. It's just a, a jeweler's magnifying glass. Yeah. The way to look just a little bit closer. We're looking at snails and the insides of flowers. Yeah. <laughs> More of that Douglas iris we were seeing. Beautiful. We have getting a lot of this vanilla leaf right in here. I can't wait to come back here when it's uh, starting to dry up and then we get that nice scent. Animal cookie fragrance. Animal cookies. Animal crackers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, animal crackers. All right. Did we pass it, Steve? Um, I don't think so. No, we're right there. Okay, down on the right. Now, one of my all-time favorites for the redwoods is this stuff. A very leathery uh, leaf. Very showy and deep green. Um, but this one is something that can really train you and say that you're missing out on a lot if you're just standing up because you got to get on your belly for this one, right? Yeah. Really <laughs> and here we go again. Okay. <laughs> and I got a beautiful one right here that we can see right here. These are Acerum caudatum, the uh, wild ginger. Wild ginger, and this one's pretty early on. It hasn't opened up yet, though, right? Look behind here. Look at there. 
that's one and that's after it's opened up no nope. they this is just some bonkers sci-fi stuff going on here with these yeah look at those long tails it looks uh somebody had told me once that this looks like the uh the alien from from uh stranger things huh. and i was like yeah i guess it does <laughs> cool yeah so like, they kind of look like um spider legs yeah yes yeah, like spider legs um you know it's uh, one of yeah it's like some of these flowers are just so amazingly cool looking and uh you know it's just all takes a little bit uh, of time to take a closer look this thing's got a nice smell also which yeah. is really hard to communicate via video but um, you know, what does it smell like? Kind of like ginger. Is that where it gets its name? Hmm, it might be. Huh. <laughs> All right, look at that. And again, this is apparently one that, when consumed in small quantities, might add some flavor to your meals, but when consumed in large quantities, could be harmful. So, um... I know folks out there like to wild craft. Um, if you run into a place, if you're in a place where it's acceptable to pick this, not in a state park. Yep, not in a state be parks. Real careful. <laughs> okay, well, now we have talked about a lot of wildflowers, and you know what? Um, I want to take this time to, you know, what? thank Angela for giving such a great program. You know it, and. Uh, also, the Hendy Woods community, um, let's see that, yeah, so the shirt, <laughs> Look, I already of course, coffee yep, on it. you got coffee and some, uh, and some <laughs> duff on it, yep. um, Hendy Woods community is an amazing organization, um, and one of our partners here at Hendy Woods State Park, I'm going to turn us around for a second, I might go back, all right, um, our partners at Hendy Woods uh, community are, uh, <laughs> Some amazing uh, people, and it's uh, volunteers like uh, like Angela here um, that help us uh, keep this park running. Um, Hendy Woods community had helped us keep the park open in 2011 here at Hendy Woods. Um, they also uh, have since manned our visitor centers as well. They lead guided hikes uh, typically every Saturday at 10 o'clock uh, throughout summer it might be 10 30. i don't know so it's been so long since last summer <laughs> but we are uh we are you know hoping and we miss uh you of course we miss all of our people as well angelo um is like one of those people who just volunteers so much like she does so much for you can't tell this girl to stop i'm a sucker yeah um, she not only is a volunteer with uh, Hendy Woods Community, she also is with uh, the Volunteer Fire Department here in Anderson Valley. Mm -hmm. And she also took on um, the Wildflower Show this, uh, this year, the Anderson yeah. Valley Wildflower Show. And I'm going to turn it around to her and let her talk all about how she's doing those things th this year. Thank you, Steve. I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Um... So the Wildflower Show in Anderson Valley is an 80-year tradition, which is pretty fantastic. So um, it started with a school teacher in the 30s who did some wildflower collection. Things have really changed since. I think that the Unity Club took it over like in the 50s or something. But they've got like 80 years worth of records for driving along certain routes, what's blooming at this route, you know, collecting one or two each, and then they would bring them all, and they still do, not this year, of course, um, to the Apple Hall at the fairgrounds and sort them by family and have each little different specimen by family in the Apple Hall, and people just visit all weekend long and see specimens. It's a really amazing volunteer effort, and the fact that it's been going on so long, I think really says a lot about how much uh, love of place so many people here have. So this year, because we can't do that, um, we kind of threw together a Facebook group. It's called Anderson Valley Wildflower Show, and we're just encouraging folks to get out there, take pictures, post them in this group, share them, um, share any observations that you have. You don't have to be an expert, you don't have to know the name, you don't have to know the family. 
we're just trying to make sure that people see what's blooming and get to enjoy everything that's kind of out there. Now, um, didn't you, um, didn't, aren't you organizing a bio blitz that's going to happen next weekend? Yes. All right. Now, for people who don't know what a bio blitz is, why don't you describe that to a lot of people, right? <laughs> so a bio blitz is kind of a moment in time or a point in time count where you take a, a, a window of time and you get as many people as possible to make observations and share them. The tool that we use for this is um, an app called iNaturalist. You can get it for Android or iOS. You download the app and then it's really easy to just take a photo of the plant that you see and then upload it and you can add it to a collection or a project. So we've got a project for May 2nd and 3rd, that's Saturday and Sunday, all day long. We're trying to encourage as many people as possible in the Anderson Valley area to just get out in your yard, get pictures of what's blooming, upload them to the Anderson Valley Wildflower Show project on iNaturalist. Um, a bio blitz is a really amazing tool. It's it's, it's citizen science at its finest. Citizen science at its finest. All right. Now, again, I uh, we'll want everybody to go ahead and uh, thank you to Angela for all the amazing knowledge she just uh, gave to us. Now, um, I also want you, and we're going to put it in the comments, uh, we're going to put a link to the... Um, to the Anderson Valley Wildflower Show page. Um, and yeah, be looking out for it. And it's thanks to uh, volunteers putting in effortless work, uh, or not effortless, but not effortless. That came out wrong. I meant tireless work um, <laughs> of, uh, you know, organizing uh, a lot of these organizations, uh, including California State Parks, uh, would not be possible without the help of some amazing volunteers like Angela um, and also one thing to look into is that unity club that uh, is backing the uh, the um, wildflower show was actually and this is why I was like oh we got to help out the unity club in their wildflower show is they were the ones who petitioned the state in order to purchase Hendy Woods that was in 1958 okay, okay. when the park was first purchased and in 1963 it was coined Hendy Wood State Park. Aww. Anyways, we're not going to get too far into park history. We've been not talking at y'all quite a lot today, but um, thank you for joining and uh, have a beautiful weekend. Thank you. Um, remember again, our uh, parks unfortunately are... Uh, closed to public access in Sonoma and Mendocino counties. Um, so do not take a trip out to visit them. Um, you know, at, uh, check out your local regulations. But we do miss you. We do uh, hope that you have a great weekend. And as the you know weather gets warmer, um, please just uh, you know utilize uh, open areas around your home uh, in order to get your exercise and enjoy this beautiful weekend. Thank you again, Stephen Yahalko with California State Parks, and I will see you soon. Bye.